Welcome to Talking About Our Generation, a new online music show where we're going to interview some uh, wonderful musicians and people from Rock's illust illustrious past. My name is Gary McVeigh Kay. I'm a, a journalist, uh, sometimes school teacher, but most of all, a massive music fan. Um, and I'm hoping that over the next few episodes, we're going to delve into Rock's glorious past uh, and, and ask some insightful and interesting questions of, of some brilliant people who we've got lined up as guests for you. Uh, I'll hand over to my co-presenter now. Well, thank you very much, Gary. My name's Simon Warner. I've been a music journalist. I was a live reviewer for The Guardian in the 1990s. I taught popular music at Leeds University for more than 20 years. Uh, and I've also published quite a number of books about the US beat writers um, and their influence on Anglo-American rock culture. But I am, like Gary, a fan of this music, I'm a fan of this stuff, and I'm really looking forward to engaging with him and also our guests on a regular basis. Well, it's great to speak to you, Simon. Uh, obviously, in our remote locations. Um, so how, how has lockdown been for you over the last few weeks, then? Well, I mean, lockdown has been quite a test, I think, for us, our families, our partners, our friends. Um, I mean, in some ways, it's been an opportunity to to read books, listen to music, catch up with Netflix, all those sorts of things. Um, I'm very glad to say that we haven't been affected in any direct way by this uh, this terrible pand pandemic, but uh, uh, you know, massive sympathies for anyone who has. Um, but for me, it's been like being in a bit of a five-star prison, all the, you know, the media facilities I want, um, and no reason to do anything else, no cafes or bars or cinemas or theatres to go to. Uh, how's it been affecting you, Gary? It's not been too bad. What I was going to ask whether you've got have this shared experience. I've, I've suddenly found out that massive pile of books that's been piled up next to my bed for the last five years uh, has very quickly started to go down as I've had time to read things. Uh, that has happened to me too. I've been reading, you know, books on, as it happens on the counterculture. I've, I've read a couple of Julian Barnes. I'm currently reading uh, a fantastic novel by a German writer called Volker. Kutcher, who wrote um, Babylon Berlin, the uh, the TV series, which has also hooked me. It's like a, a, a noir 1920s Weimar Republic thriller uh, with a Sopranos feel. So I've seen the TV show and now I've been reading the book. So what 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 things have you been getting your teeth into? I've been um, I've been indulging in a bit of uh, Ask Alexa um, <laughs> and, 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 and finding out that I'm, you know live streaming that there are things there that you just didn't think existed so i've been shouting very random names at it things like um, kippington lodge oh, and right. a stack stack waddy and <laughs> um, expecting it to say that not known at, at, at this place but i've been really pleasantly surprised that there has been lots of kippington lodge and stack waddy so i'm sort um, of uh, tra traversing back to the 60s really and imagining john peel introducing these bands Sure, and, and, and in fact, for, for me too, um, I've been checking out this American band called White Denim, who are these incredible sort of uh, pastichers. They pay homage to the 70s and 80s. There's, there's a bit of funk, there's a bit of steely down, there's a bit of glam, there are all sorts of things in there. And when you listen to them, you feel like you're being taken on uh, a bit of time travel. And it's very enjoyable for those of us, uh, uh, those of, us of a certain age who, you know, think back to those earlier decades and see their music being recreated anew. It, it's wonderful. I'm glad you clarified that because when you started talking about white denim on the Facebook a couple of weeks ago, I, I just envisaged you'd, you'd, you'd gone back to the future and you were wearing white denim again to right? yeah. try and reclaim your youth. You were expecting me to, to, to come on screen in double denim and it all be white. It's With not a cheese thought. I, I'm, a cheesecloth cheese cheese cloth shirt. <laughs> That's right, yes. We anyway, all, I, when I say we all had them, I certainly had them myself, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's time to uh, introduce our guest now for our first segment. So, uh, the guest on our first show is a brilliant singer-songwriter, musician, producer. He's worked with everybody from Eddie Reader to K.D. Lang. He was the frontman of the uh, 80s uh, indie band The Bible. Uh, and a, a, an all-round good egg. Um, so, we're going to, uh, by the magic of technology, in a second, we're going to have Boo Hooading. So welcome, Boo Hooadin, um, to the show. Um, first question, Boo, how, how's lockdown been for you? Well, it's probably the same as it has been for everybody else. It's been kind of strange because I'm a touring musician. Over the first two or three days, I saw an entire year's worth of 
gigging disappear. But things have been sort of amazingly busy and interesting. I've been working on lots of projects with other people, other musicians in their homes. I've been uh, mentoring people, which is something I've done for quite a long time. That's been, and I love doing that. I've had some amazing uh, adventures working with people and seeing them flourish and uh, writing with other people, starting my own record, working with Brooks Williams from State of the Union. So actually, I don't think I've ever been quite as busy. It used to be really easy doing a gig. You just sit on a train for a bit because I toured on the train. You turn up, you <coughs> pretend to sit down, check, and then do a gig, you know. But now they expect you to work all day. I, I didn't <laughs> <really> like it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, did you miss your audiences, Boo? Uh, they probably, I probably miss them more than they miss me. Uh, yes, of course I do. I have done a couple of online gigs. I'm doing a, a, a charity gig tonight for refugees in Glasgow. And it's sort of a little bit odd doing a gig and, and, and uh, no clapping at the end of it. But I've got used to it now. I did one for the Green Note about a week ago and I really enjoyed it. And they, they got a great format and there were three of us. So we were chatting with each other and... It felt nice, but yes, you do miss it. It, it, it. Yeah, I mean Brooks, who I was working with this morning, he does hundreds of gigs, and it's it is. It's like a it's like a pain, you know. Around nine o'clock, you should be showing off in front of people, but <laughs> no one in this flat's interested. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're here interested, but for huh? <laughs> we're here. Joking, of course they are. But they, no, I don't do full gigs, so I can't really charge <laughs> my family. Um, all money, can I? Would you like me to sign it? No, no, you're all right. <laughs> you do, do, do you give refunds? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, yeah. And uh, no, it's been it's 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 nice. We live, we moved uh, to Glasgow last August, and so we've been. But we're very we're very glad we're here. It's a really fun. We're in the, on the south side, and it's just it's just uh, feels really good. If we've got to be anywhere. This feels like the place to be while you're locked in, yeah. And it, it's a city with a great musical reputation. I mean, oh, it's, in, it's incredible. Well, I mean, I've, it, it's part of the reason we moved here, mainly because I always used to in, really enjoy it when I came here on tour and be play at Celtic Connections every year, which is the big folk festival. But Eddie Reader, who I work with a lot, lives here. Finley Napier, who I work with a lot, lives here. My friend, Mark Freegard, I mentioned the engineer, he, he, he lives here. But the most incredible thing is that I, I first went to my school in Cambridge on the same day. We, I didn't start at the beginning. I arrived three years in, so I was a new boy. And there was another new boy, and he arrived that on that same day. And then they so they separated us, so we wouldn't sort of uh, sort of get to know each other. But he lives by pure coincidence. I live in a square, and I can see into his front room from from my front room. Oh, wow. Chances of that. <laughs> So fact, I'm going to speak to him straight after I've spoken to you. So, fantastic. Yeah, there's lots of reasons to be here. It's a fantastic place. Okay. Yes, um, music. We've hmm. been consuming it in all sorts of ways for many decades. I think I'm a little bit older than Boo, and Boo's a little bit older than Gary, but we're all broadly of, the, of similar gen generations. Yeah. But, but, but I was remembering a time. I mean, I, w when I go back to my very earliest days of, uh, of, of buying music, um, in 19, I think it was 1963. I was probably six years of age. And I had to, at that stage, wear specs, and I still do, as you see. I, I, I had to wear specs, and my... Uh, dear departed mother very kindly said to me uh, as you've been so good about the spec wearing thing we're all wearing specs aren't we yeah as you've been so good about the specs wearing thing uh, we'd like to buy you a gift and uh, she asked me what I'd like and, and I said could I have a record um, mm. and we went into a Cheshire record store um, South Manchester and uh, you might remember this boo I don't think Gary does but my mother and I stepped into a listening booth do you remember listening i booth? know what they are but i think i'm just I, I missed out on the on the year of the listening booth there might have been one in a jazz shop that i used to go to in london when they kept it there for they, nostalgic they, they, reasons you know were still around when you yeah. were, were checking out the music but we stood in the booth um we listened to she loves you by the beatles 
Yeah. Followed by Not Fade Away by the Rolling Stones. Yeah. And I, as a six year old uh, music fan to be, I guess, was persuaded by my mother to buy She Loves You. And mm. uh, so for six and eightpence, probably doesn't mean anything to you or Gary, but for no, six. No, no, of course it does. Yeah, that, that would be uh, six and eightpence would be, that would be. Th 35 and a half pence, I think. That's extremely <laughs> close, isn't it? Yeah, 35 and a half pence. Um, and from there on, I was just hooked on this thing. And for the next 50 mm. odd years, I've been doing it. But what, what was your first um, musical consumption, Boo? Where, where, where did you get it? Where did you buy it? I, 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 got it. I, I think I probably started a bit later than you. In fact, the first single I bought, and I only remembered this the other day, and I bought it because I like <coughs> tune ridiculous it was blue is the color by chelsea what a terrible <laughs> first single absolutely terrible is that because you were a chelsea fan no not at all i thought oh that's a nice tune i didn't know they were a they were a football team i just thought they were a very large group <laughs> <laughs> and so i got that and then amazingly there's a man called rob peters that i work with now he's a drummer guy and his his cousin wrote that so we talk about that quite often so Actually, I bought that and then I thought, well, I'm not sure records are really for me. And I left it for a while. And then um, the first album I bought, and I still love this album, is Ian Hunter's first solo album, which is called Ian Hunter. Yes. And I thought it was a fantastic record. My friend John Kelly, producer John Kelly, that was his first job. He was the T-boy on that record, so I like that. And then the second record I bought was uh, Sgt. Pepper's by The Beatles. And I thought, God, blimey, albums are good, aren't they? They're really good. <laughs> And then it's been a, a very long, slow, disappointing road. Since then. <laughs> no, and what, 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 so what, 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 what did you play them on? What, I mean, what, what oh, was my your dad had a, my dad had a fancy hi-fi. My dad had a fancy hi-fi, so I didn't have really a record player. I had a little dance set thing that somebody gave me when I was young, and they gave me. I, I, I remember we had eight singles. And one of them was "What Do You Want to Make Those Eyes at Me For?" and another, another was "I Remember You" by Frank Ifield. And I thought, oh, I don't really like records. Obviously, they're all right. And um, so I played them on there. And then, of course, uh, the, the fateful, uh, fateful um, Christmas where my sister bought me uh, on gold vinyl new boots and panties by Ian Jury, and uh, and, I, and I had a lot of room full of elderly aunts, and I played that track. You know the one I mean, don't you? <laughs> Blaring out of my dad's four foot speakers. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, so the dog you, remembers uh, that as well. So. <laughs> would you say that those um, those coloured vinyl records didn't they wear out more quickly? I, I, I had a. I think that one wore out very quickly because I think it was <laughs> taken away from me by angry parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. They were rubbish. I picture, and then I worked in a record shop later, and picture discs were terrible. They'd after about three plays, they'd, the whole thing would collapse. Yes. I do remember though, this is like, I had a manager and we got, uh, do you remember the Beatles re-released all their singles on picture disc? Yeah. And yeah. we got one of them, I can't remember which one, would say it's from me to you or something like that. And uh, the B-side wasn't the correct song. It was, uh, they'd put um, uh, Silver Machine by Hawkwind on it. <laughs> right? So uh, I said, do you think you should keep that? That might be valuable one day. He said, no, I'm sending it back to EMI. I mean, can you imagine? I could just the three of us could have lived and several generations <laughs> off that that misprice there. So um, yeah, and um, and then the gigs. Uh, my first gigs, uh, the first gig, proper gig I went to was Dr. Feelgood at the, around the time of at their peak when they they were recording Stupidity during that tour, and they were so so exciting. Now, I, I saw Dr. Feelgood on a tour with two other bands, Kokomo and Chili Willy and the Red Hot Peppers. Would that have been around the same time? I think it was probably a, a tad later. I think it would be 70, 75, 74, 75. I didn't start going to gigs probably and buying records a bit later than than you. I, you see, I went to a school where everybody liked prog rock and I didn't like prog rock. It just it made me feel uncomfortable and, and a bit a bit scared. And then there was, as in, as in every class, there would be one, there'd be one sort of cool guy and he brought in down by the jetty and that was sort of that really spoke to me that was a really life-changing record and it also made me go back and really explore 60s r and b and right go all the way back to robert johnson and all that sort of thing so i was on a very different path to all my mates who were enjoying emerson lake and palmer and stuff and i probably should listen to them and they're probably great but at the time they seemed you know big pictures of armadillos with with 
tire tracks on the front i thought well, that, that doesn't really speak to me <laughs> so so what what was the first record that you had where you were the cool guy then boo oh that happened pretty oh that was pretty pretty quick oh i was never the the one there was another guy i remember at the same time uh in another class but he became a friend of mine and he ended up working as a bbc producer actually and he, i remember he had the first ramon single in 74 as well so i i was just it was so exciting and then hanging around little grungy indie shops and sniffing glue and all that sort of stuff it just i i really loved that and i did end up working in a record shop like that called the beat goes on in cambridge for quite a long time it felt like a very natural home so uh it was a very, that period just being like with new wave of punk or whatever it, it really uh that's that that to me was uh, a very important time of course i love the beatles i absolutely love the beatles my favorite group ever and i've i'm very jealous of anyone who had your experience of buying those records when they were, they were current and uh, i loved a lot of the people that i work with i have either worked with the beatles or know fantastic beatles stories and i i can never ever get tired did you ever read that book, that really th uh, thick book called All Those Years Ago, I think it was called, which is just the first of a trilogy of... Oh, it's the, the Mark, Mark Lewison. Amazing. Book, yeah. So I just got, yeah. the, I just got the, the basic one. There's, a, there's another one, which is like 100, which is 3,000 pages instead of 1,000. And I remember reading that, and I loved every page. And they talked about how when Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were playing at Butlins, one night an elephant escaped and fell in a swimming pool and drowned. And, and then it said in brackets, the elephant was called Elsie. And I remember thinking, crikey, if this is the level of detail in the, in the abridged version, what's it going to be like? <laughs> He's so. an astonishing scholar, Mark. And, and, yeah, and, and, I love that first book. It's so brilliant because it's, it, it, you know, the thing where they had to dr sort of go across Liverpool in a bus because there was someone on the other side of the city who knew how to play a B7, things like that. They're beautiful stories, you know. And, and Gary, let's not leave you out. When what cool. was your first record, and where did you buy it? Well, first record I bought, and, and this is why I'm interested in this subject because you, you, I, I teach young people as part of my job, and I try to explain to them what the, the record buying experience was. So I remember jumping on a bus after school, going into town to mix music, handing over I think it's forty nine p, and buying um, a, a town called Malice by the Jam, getting on the bus to go home, taking it out of its sleeve putting it on the record player, listening to it, then listening to it again. And it was, for, for me, it was that physical experience of listening to music, which, wonderful as the little box in the corner called Alexa is, um, it, it's just not the same without putting something from a, a, a cardboard sleeve onto a turntable. And it's that physical engagement, really, I think, of records. And I mean, what, 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 do, do, I mean, do you listen to much vinyl these days, Boo? I must confess I don't. I don't, I don't even have a CD player. I, I, I'm, I'm appalled at myself for the, you know, I've come from a family where a lot of people have wonderful hi-fis, but sometimes when you make music, you don't, I very rarely, I've got thousands of things on my computer and stuff, but I really rarely listen to other people's music. I'm making it all the time, which, but I, I think I'm missing out because when I do go and like say my brother-in-law's got a fantastic rig and he plays, oh, I don't know, he last time we were there, I think he played, um, um, what's it called? Uh, Miles Davis. Um, you know the the, the kind of blue. That kind of blue, of course. My goodness, it sounded uh, astonishing, and so I know I'm missing out, and I'm 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 cross with myself. And of course, I used to love those. Uh... This is the the thing. I can't say this man's name. Can you? The man who used to. I was telling you just before we came on who the who what is mixing. Who like... hmm? worked with Costello? Yeah, Roger. Pachirian. is that how you say it? I don't know, but he did. I think that could be how you say it. <laughs> I, 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 I have no idea how you say it. And uh, he just sent this mix, and it's like, oh my god, it's so exciting! It sounds brilliant. And I, but I remember buying Trust, which he produced, uh, the Elvis Costello record. I remember that that for some reason of all the records that I remember being like almost sort of sick with excitement and then putting it on and, and studying the sleeve. I don't know why that one so much, but I was living in a little bed sit at the time and. It was just a little bit of gold in the room compared to sort of the crappy little situation I was in. So, and to and the fact that he's mixing a a song right now that I was involved with is that ooh, that's exciting. Which doesn't really answer your question. I seem to have gone off on. A no, sorry, but but now you see we walk 
we walk around with with sixty thousand tracks on something that size. And yeah. Well, the whole experience that. has changed. You don't even need that anymore. Yeah. It all all streaming away, which is completely knackered. My, you know, me and my pals. It's completely knackered our. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's nice to see that the uh, man who invented Spotify, he's got two and a half billion dollars, isn't he, of ours. That's nice. I'll see. That's nice. <laughs> somebody's, somebody's working with that with me. I mean, it, it shows how old I am when I say to, to both of you that I'm, I'm faintly disgusted that I can just go onto my computer and find any boo hoo dine track I want. Yeah. <laughs> Having had the original Bible album, you know, 35 mm. years ago, got rid of all my vinyl five years ago. That was among the, the collection. But I, I, I actually value music to such an extent where I want to put a value on it. I, I want to actually give people like you, music makers, um, a reward. And it just doesn't seem to be a fair system anymore. It, it isn't, but it's, a very, it's very interesting in that, that the idea of music being worth something um as it, it's a relatively new thing and it's come and it's going i mean you know the old your, your old wandering minstrel never got any prs so we're just having to rethink of rethink about how we every all my friends who do this we absolutely love doing this and feel it's such a privilege so if you want to keep doing it we're going to have to be duck and dive a bit and think of, of different ways of making it work and that's been a bit of an adventure to be honest i'm, I'm a bit of an optimist you know and that's kind of the way i've always been because like you say that first bible album that was made it was i worked in a warehouse for a year to afford it no one was interested i made it and suddenly everyone was interested i've always been a bit like that it's like if it's if it's if it's hard i just go all right what do i do now so yes it is it's 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 annoying but you can't it's, you can't change it no. i remember being in record company meetings uh when I, I was on Warners or something at the time and I was in a meeting, I somehow I ended up, they didn't ask me to leave. They just sort of, uh, I just had a meeting where they told me how, they didn't like my hair or something. And I'm sitting in the corner and I hear this thing and, the, and somebody basically said, how are we going to stop the internet? And I thought, oh my God, this is, this is, <laughs> you've, you've got the wrong end of the stick here. You can't, it's like you're King Canute, isn't it? You can't do it. So I kind of think I, you accept it. And it reminds me a little bit of Spotify arguments, I mean, like the home taping is killing music. It kind of did the exact opposite thing, the home taping. It spread it like all of us had tapes from our mates and it spread music out and it actually did the exact opposite, except the record companies weren't be benefiting, you know. So I mean, there, there, I mean, there's a good story that Elvis Costello uh, tells us, you know, that, that he was one of those songwriters who was born between that time where a songwriter was bought off with um, the purchase of a car for his song, you know, by yeah. his American manager. Yeah. Uh, he was writing songs between that and the arrival of the internet. He was still in the golden age. And, yes, uh, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly, there have been a couple of songs, you know, I'm not, not had any, anything like his success or whatever, but there have been a couple of songs along the way that have helped me and my family survive. And uh, now they wouldn't, you know. With a so it's sort of uh, the same things could happen, but the the the, the income will be non-existent. So, it's... Um, and one day soon, we're all going to have chips implanted into us where we can just access music like that whenever we want, anyway. So. Well, and what what a glorious day that will be! <laughs> it will, it will. <laughs> <laughs> So, as we've already seen, our guest today is Boo Huadin, brilliant songwriter of the uh, 80s band The Bible, and now uh, famed in his own right as a songwriter, producer, and a maker of music himself and others. Uh, and we're going to chat now to Boo about his career, really. So, Boo, we talked um, earlier in the show about your sort of consumption of music as, as a young person, uh, but there was obviously a point where you stop being just a fan of music and, and dipped your toe into the actual writing process. So talk us through how, how that came about. Well, I remember being seven or eight and thinking I want to be a songwriter. I remember that. I really distinctly remember that. I had no, I didn't have the wherewithal and I didn't learn the guitar until even, even after I'd started writing songs. But I, it's kind of, I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. I sort of think in the songs, so eventually... That was what I was going to do. Uh, but I worked in, like in, I was saying in the record shop and record warehouses. 
and we got uh, we we made i i was in a, i was in a school band and then i was in a I, I was in a band i was thinking about this the other day uh, and we made a really really good tape and we were called placebo thing that's a good name isn't it and <laughs> i got a, i sent out some cassettes and i got a call from uh some record companies and one of them was virgin i think it was i was 19 or something like that. and it, and they said will you come down and meet us and um I, I said, yes, yeah. So I, I didn't had no way of getting down. I was completely broken. So my friend offered to uh, drive me down on his motorbike and we just got on the motorway and the, and the engine fell out of his motorbike. <laughs> so we had to abandon it. So I sort of rescheduled it. And the luck, they said, no, no, we really want to hear you. So I was great. So I went down to, when it was in Vernon Yard, and I remember Paul Yates was in reception and the big bull bloke out of, Gillen was walking out holding copies of his new record and I thought oh this this looks really good and I went into the meeting and the guy said you're really really good I don't know who it was I've no idea who it was it's so long ago and he said yeah we'd like to sign you I said oh fantastic and I just went home and I didn't know what happened next I didn't we didn't have a manager I, I didn't know anything I don't think he even had a sort of proper way of uh staying in touch with me or anything so uh it was only years later I realized that I I, I probably would be uh you know, as famous as um, a famous person, if it, if if I'd that had happened. So I then after that I started a new band, uh, which was a band called The Great Divide, and they signed to Ensign Records, uh, which was then was part of Ireland, and we were we made some very very um, well we weren't very successful at all, but it was very interesting in that the man who A and R'd us was a man called Nigel Grange who. He's a really great man, and he's always in my head when I'm, whenever I'm making records. I don't know if you've just seen that Boomtown Rats thing. Yeah, I watched it even night, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you look, the last thing it says is dedicated to Nigel Grange. And to oh, pe right. pe people who, he died a couple of years ago, the people who know him, he was an incredible person because he would he was interested in people that no one else was interested in. It was like no one was interested in Boomtown Rats. No one was interested in Sinead O'Connor. They were on that label. No one was interested in Mike Scott. The Waterboys was on that label. It's a brilliant environment to be in. As it happened, we didn't we didn't quite have the wherewithal to do it. And we broke up and then I started the Bible, which is sort of the the, the one that was the first one that uh did okay. And I, we made a record uh, that I saved up for a year in a work in a warehouse and made a record in a, a, a studio near Cambridge called Spaceful, but also a, a really tiny studio in Islington called Red Shop Recorders. So uh, I don't think my dog's going to respond to your clap when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an amazing adventure <clears throat> because uh, especially once the Bible started, all these doors immediately opened and we had a, we had a wonderful manager. We were really, really lucky. We were pro approached by this sports uh, master in Harlow who said he wanted to manage us. And he was, we were also approached by some really big management. And this guy, like um, Miles Copeland's lot and all that, but this guy said he wanted to come and see us uh, rehearse and uh, our our keyboard player had a dog and he offered to walk the dog so that's why we gave him the gig so he was our manager and that was marcus russell who then went on to manage oasis and we were so lucky because he was the most straight ahead honest brilliant guy so we really we had we were very very lucky to um to have him looking after us and I know uh, people often say, oh, you weren't very successful, were you? But for us, we're working in warehouses and stuff. It felt, it felt great. And I'll put a, lot, put a lot of it down to him, you know, the level that we got to. And he, was, <laughs> he had really good taste as well, so he never allowed us to make anything. Cheap. And ha how old were you when you first started writing your first song then? Oh, well, I, I remember being 17 and writing songs for local bands but i didn't play an instrument i didn't pick an instrument up for another year or so and so i would just make up tunes and words and i'd actually sing them to people and people liked them and they'd work work the chords out and local bands started you know that a few of them do, would do my songs it's still my biggest thrill of all is if i get a cd or someone sends me a version of something i've worked on it it it, it, it remains the most exciting thing like that mix i've just said i've just received just now i it never never goes away i do collect my own records don't judge me 
they're all, they're all, they're all in a lockup. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, Boo, about uh, when you've had your songs covered by other people. I mean, you, yeah. you've already partially answered this, but uh, is there ever a sort of sense that you don't want to relinquish control of a song, or, no. or are you quite happy to give stuff away in a vertical comment? I, 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 to me, one of the massive thrills of writing songs is what people do with them because you can't, you can't unwrite a song. I mean, a good example would be My Way by Frank Sinatra and by Sid Vicious. It's the same song. You can't, you can't unwrite a song. So if somebody does something in a very different arrangement to the one I've written it in or I've recorded it in, it's exciting to me because it's still, it, it never stops being the song that you've written. And there are a few songs I've written that have been recorded by, I don't know, 10 or 12 people, and they're all very different versions. It's exciting. I'm all, I, I, I'm never going to say to someone, "Oh yeah, no, nah, I'm not sure about that." It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not part of the joy of it for me. Have, have you ever heard a version where you feel as if the artist has missed the point, or just not? Yes, once. Are you able to reveal that to us? I am not sure. I can. It was a woman. I'm not sure I can remember her name. And she's a very, very nice woman. It was a song that was. I thought quite a tender song and, and, and it was recorded in quite an aggressive way and I just didn't think it quite worked. But I didn't say no because it's, it's interpretation, isn't it? But in, I would say every other time I've been delighted. I, I, probably the most delighted I've ever been was when Chris Drever recorded a song of mine called Harvest Gypsies. And I, I, could, I was so gobsmacked by how great his version was. I remember we were on tour and playing it over and over again and being really moved by his take on it. And it was nothing like my take at all. So that's it's cool, you know. And that, that kind of leads me on to the next question then, really, that, you, you know, you write in many different ways. You write for yourself, mm. totally as a solo artist. You write in collaboration with other people. Mm. Um, you, you write for other people. So, so what are the things that you enjoy most about those different kinds of writing? Well, each of them have, has, has, has something really special about them. All my best friends are... I think more or less I've been I've met through songwriting and you develop really sort of unique relationships with people because you're it's quite a sort of um sort of you open up in front of someone and then you and then if it works it's a really lovely trusting feeling I really like writing with people I'm writing with a couple of people at the moment who aren't maybe not written quite so much and I'm sharing some things with them and then hearing them change that's really exciting. Um, the most difficult thing is always writing for myself, and I have to really trick myself into doing it. But I love it's probably the thing I, I like, feel the most achievement of when I do it. But I, I, I do have to totally trick myself into doing that. <laughs> you should tell us a bit more about that, Boo, because um, I was wondering whether for you songwriting was a kind of is it a technical craft where you try and make something that's going to be to use a terribly old phrase, a hit, or do you want to write a song that strikes a chord with you? What, what, what are you trying to do? Well, at this stage, just the, trying to write a hit. I mean, occasionally that will sort of bubble up into my consciousness or like the thing I've been talking about, the mix I've heard, I think it will, it's, it, I think it will be uh, in, within its, in it, and that's exciting. But with my own work for a long time, it's more to do with the sort of, connection and and somebody somewhere maybe hearing it and feeling what i felt and there is but i think sometimes people say oh he's a craftsman and stuff i mean I'm, i do know all that stuff but i i and i share it as well with w workshops but for me just being good at your gig means you can get to the the sort of nub of something quicker than if you're going oh does it go like this does it go like that should this bit go there if you get sort of really sort of train yourself in that stuff, then it becomes the, the, the it, it becomes much more of an emotional experience rather yeah. than a technical one, which is why I, I like to read about the craft and I like to share it, but not because I'm sort of pedantic. It's so you, actually, so it becomes less important in the process just because it's something you're good at, like being a trained, trained athlete or something, you know, I, I remember right. Anxious, they thought. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a young journalist writing favourably about Graceland, you know, back in the late... Oh, thank you. And, and I also remember that, that decade of 
great songwriters like Costello and Joe yeah. Jackson and Paddy McAloon and Gary Clark of Danny Wilson and, and so oh, on. A really good friend of mine, Gary, yeah. Is he? I, I, I love mm. Danny Wilson. But when I re returned to listen to Graceland again in the, in the last few days, I was hearing, was there some sort of C86 influence on that? Was there some kind of jangling, shambling influence on that record? It was a very interesting band because possibly, but the other partner in the band was very much a really, uh, a, a real musician's musician. And that, I think that was why it sounded unusual. So yeah, there was a little bit of that, but it was all very, very um, pure music. I can't think of a better way of doing, putting it. Sounds, but yeah, I love, I love indie. I love, I love punk, and all, and Tony came from a completely different place. He, although he played keyboards in the Bible, he was actually a very well-known jazz drummer. So it's the mixture of the two and the clash. Actually, we would argue quite a lot, which is where, if there was anything special or different about us that's where it came from so yeah i had that i had that record but it was not um there's also elements in there of like um uh, because of nigel i remember this was because of nigel grange that we, we were talking about earlier he had told me not long before then about how he'd signed 10 cc after they'd been um uh, let go by jonathan king lucky yeah. lucky bleeders <laughs> and uh <laughs> And he, they, they, he, and nobody wanted to touch them. And they were a studio band, and mostly known at that point for playing with Neil Sadaka. But he, he, they, he, they invited up, him up to Strawberry Studios in Manchester, and said, "We'd like to play you something." And they played, "I'm Not in Love to Him." And he said it was of his whole career was probably the most mind blowing experience to hear that for the first time, blasting out of the speakers. Yeah. So if you listen carefully again. We use the same technique, but in a much more Heath Robinson way to which it, 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 the, the backing vocals involved uh, our friend Jane singing uh, various notes and the studio was festooned with uh, mic stands and holding up tapes in huge loops. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there was a bit of the shambly stuff, but we also would go into incredible detail to try and achieve things using the sort of limited resources we had. So try 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 selling yeah. that to kids today. With a sampler, their yeah. <laughs> and then you and then you had to you, you had to do like they did, you had to do the mix with uh uh use it moving faders. I mean, because all <laughs> I'm not in love is all done it's it's a, it's a live performance of the mix. Yeah. Which is why you get these wonderful moments where things bump into each other and all that sort of thing. And of course you could do that with a computer now and it would be perfect, but it wouldn't <laughs> be perfect, you know. So it's a great record without that yeah. yeah it's a very especially uh, uh, yes so uh, we we weren't we were more and until gary clark and danny wilson came along we, we were probably more kindred to them than any other band and and he became an incredibly good friend of of mine and we've worked together and uh, he's doing incredibly well at the moment you should speak to him goodness me he's got he's got fantastic things going on at the moment i don't recommend because I, I, i'm a big fan of, of his too but... well he's got he's written um uh theater he's, he's got a thing which would be on broadway right now he's written film stuff he's like he's he it, it's sort of uh he he doesn't he stopped performing largely but he's incredibly productive and and, and successful these days so wow mm. now in, in the introduction I, I should have been able to introduce you as uh, boo hurridan Mm. Ivan Avello Award winner, um, of which you came very close to with, with um, Patients of Angels. But there's a bit of a story behind the fact that you kind of, it was Schrodinger's award, wasn't it? Because you won it and didn't win it all on the set at the same well, time. I mean, uh, yes, can, you the, talk, I mean, can you talk us yeah, through that? The in the press release, it said that I'd won it. And I found out that I had got the most votes, but there was a little backstage coup and they gave it to... Um, the people who wrote uh, Think Twice by Celine Dion instead. So it's really odd. So I'm sitting in there with uh, my young daughter and uh, they said, and the winner, and people have been coming up to me and congratulating me because there was a press release outside in the foyer and they'd seen it and <laughs> bringing me champagne and then, and then I didn't win it. So, but mo morally you did? I suppose. It's, it's a funny story, really. I like it. It's a funny story. It is, uh, <laughs> And you then I, and that I was a judge the following year, so I found out that it was, it was something, yeah, I, that's how I found out the story because people told me the following year. 
And let's be honest, you didn't miss out because, you know, it's like Celine Dion, whatever happened to her, you know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody said her verses. Well, I know. I, 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 last time I played Royston Folk Club, I noticed she wasn't on the notice board, so she <laughs> disappeared, you know. <laughs> but it's funny, I don't... It's, it, it, those sorts of, I've had thousands of things like that happen, uh, that, that they just make me laugh, really. It was a nice mm. day out. <laughs> <laughs> Simon. Well, I just wanted to ask you one last question in this segment, if, if I could. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we've talked about the Bible, we've talked about other bands that you worked with. Yeah. Um, is it possible to, to briefly sum up what the difference is between being in a unit and being a solo writer? Is, is, would you prefer to be the latter? I probably prefer to be the latter these days, but there's something about having been in a band that is really very, very special and shows you something about life or something. There's a brilliant film. It's my favourite music film. It's called New York Doll, and it's about a thingy killer. What was he called? You know your trivia. What was the bass player called? So, uh, uh, Arthur, Arthur Kane. Yeah, Arthur Killer Kane. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's a fantastic film. I can't recommend it enough. It starts. It, it starts being a film about him uh, because he works at the Tabernacle in Salt Lake City in the Mormon Church, and he's the librarian. My goodness me! And then during the course of making the film, the idea of them reforming for meltdown uh, happens, and you see, and he he's like an old guy. He's an old beaten guy. And then as they re as they meet up again, and they all fell out really badly. As they meet up again, and they you see them rehearsing, he grows in stature, and he's 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 transformed. <coughs> he's transformed, and it's he's the driving force about them all getting together. And you see this incredible performance of them at meltdown at the festival hall, and then two weeks afterwards he dies. Incredible, and but I sort of saw that look, that change in the way someone holds us off is somebody who's been in a band. So I never regret being in a band, but my goodness me, we, we would argue and I love them. I love the, those people really deeply, but we would, we'd all, even when we've we reformed in recent years, we sometimes do gigs once a, once a year or so, and they get better every year actually. But some, some during the process, the old, the, the old um, niggles arise and you don't get that as a solo performer. So, you know, <laughs> trying to argue with yourself on a train <laughs> well yeah yes you can normally get a seat to yourself if you <laughs> well boo listen it's been, been fascinating to talk to you we're going to talk I to you in the so. first i hope section. i haven't we'll gassed on too much I, not I, at all i didn't know if you wanted it to be more of a conversation rather than a monologue <laughs> no absolutely it's been fast, fascinating hearing some of your stories yeah. and um we, we, we'll join you again in the first section of the show to talk about a couple of your songs in a bit more depth but um just for now boo who did thank you very much thank you so one of the things that we are keen to talk about in this series of podcasts is songwriters and their songs yeah. and uh, fantastic having boo who are doing here because we're going to talk about a, a recent song of his called silhouette and uh, he's going to tell us in a moment what this song is perhaps about or how it came about but uh, it's a fascinating piece this because it strikes me it feels like a song that could be a pre-pop era ballad it feels like it could have come before the Beatles and as I listen to the wonderful production on it it's very stripped back with I think a clarinet and some sort of music box sound on it yeah. it's it, it, it's very enticing I was also thinking though Boo that uh, although obviously you, you present the song in your um, in your particular way, it's a kind of song that could be sung by a Tom Waits, isn't it? It's got that sort of atmosphere to it. Um, yeah, it could be, yeah. Uh, I, I, he could take, you know, bring his gruff tones to the song and, and, and give it real. I tried, to, I tried to be gruff, Simon. I really did. <laughs> <laughs> but t t yeah, tell us a little bit about this. It, 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 it's a sort of little song in that it's quite understated the production How okay the there's quite a lot to there's quite a lot to talk about with this uh first of all yes you're right that, that era of songwriting i love i love delving into that on occasions and i find it very stimulating and moving i like the 
I like this lyrical con conceits and and thoughts that you can carry through in a whole song that doesn't happen with more sort of loose modern writing. I really like the chordal movement. I like melody. I think I got that's a different type of writing, but every now and then I want to do that and I want to just write a song that does those things. But the thing I feel with my writing that it's, I, you said, oh, someone else could do it. I really like writing songs that maybe someone else could sing. There's something about that rather than the, I write a lot with Chris <coughs> Difford, who's wonderful. I love Chris and we've done, well, I think we're on our fourth thing together and, and I speak to him all the time and he's one of my heroes, but they're very idiosyncratic, his songs, and they don't tend to be sung by other people. I'm very interested in songs being not to do with me, but just going out there and living and in terms of the sound for the last record i've got a guy that i work with called chris pepper and we started collecting old instruments and the instrument that you hear that you said like a music box is called a dulcitone which was used to be built in glasgow a hundred years ago which is like a keyboard but instead of strings you hit tuning forks and it was used uh, in uh for church services it in 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 flats and in tenements so that people could play quietly and sing quietly and not disturb people wow. i absolutely love it we've got we've got two at the studio and then, and another friend's got another one as well which is amazing because they're probably only 100 ever made and i did some recording with it because i was so excited with it uh and then it grew into into the the last record and then all the clarinet stuff all the extra arrangement stuff is a friend of mine called gustav lundgren who comes from denmark well, he comes from Sweden, but he lives in Denmark. And is, uh, I've been working with him for 20 years now, and he, uh, he's a genius. He's actually a genius. I, I feel so lucky to have met him. So I can say, this is the atmosphere that I want, and he, he'll do it for me. And I wanted to make something very sparse and felt like just a song rather than production. So, and as far as what's the song about, it's a, I just tried to imagine a song that was written in 1940 that might have been in a... In a musical or something. Yes, I mean it's the sort of song that could turn up in a period movie, isn't it? From yeah. the late nineteen forties. But what I try to do is not write in pastiche. I'm not. I don't really like to do that. So I, <coughs> it, it's still. I still are applying some things to it uh, that hopefully steer it away from pastiche. And this is not probably very interesting, but uh, I managed for the bridge. I'm in E. And I managed to get the bridge jumps up to F and then through a long, complicated set of chords, I managed to work my way back to E. And I, I, I was very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, <I'll, laughs> those, those sort of chordal shifts are, are, are very interesting on the ear. And when I called it a small song, I was thinking of it being kind of miniature. It's got that. Yes, yes I, I know. I took that as, a, yes, like a, yes, totally a vignette. Or sort of, totally. That's, I, I'm very interested in the small song. I think there's a place for, you know, I will always love you and so forth. But some of the songs that have moved me the most, and I like Tom Waits' song, I'm Still Here, I find unbearably moving and it's about a minute long and I think it's the most masterful wonderful song you know um, I think there's a place for those I, why is it when someone's bawling a big ballad at you at the top of their lungs you don't feel anything whereas somebody sings a little song you find yourself you're in tears and that's what I'm interested in well I think because the whole album is very delicate it's a very delicate album well if, and, I, pressed, and, if, I, if I played the dulcet tone too hard it would actually physically fall apart so that's <laughs> And, and I think the other interesting thing with the album is, is I, th I think it was Gustav Lundgren, he created the interludes, didn't he, between mm. the songs. And, and again, so without it being, it's, it's not a concept album in that sense, but the, the delicacy of, of, of the dulcet tone threading through the whole album uh, makes it feel very, um, almost sort of fairy tale ish on my first hearing of it. Mm, um, fair in, 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 that, in that sort of delicate way. Um, but it, it's also very... Uh, reflective album but without sounding very mournful you know it's, no, it's, i'm not i'm not if that's the thing i know i don't think that being mournful is is great but that that's never even though there's some sort of sad or sounding songs they're not they're reflective rather and i also feel as i've gone on longer is that the thing about why, why we go to an album and the albums that we love is that they retain a, a little there's a little universe that say johnny mitchell's blue creates and you you know you're in that place for 40 minutes and 
I'm really yeah. interested in that these days. I don't I think that's a bit of a lost thing. Some albums sort of jump about all over the place and you don't know if you're doing a so uh it was fun to give myself the constraint of playing an instrument that I wasn't that familiar with as the starting point. And actually sometimes when you give yourself constraints you find yourself being more creative than if you've got the an endless canvas, if you know what I mean. I, I know it's like the serendipity of the time, but I, I, I've, been, I've been listening to it a lot when I've been going out for my daily exercise, my daily walk, because I go on a three-mile walk and, yeah. uh, every day, and, and I've had it on my headphones. And it's and, and just at, at, at this time, I don't know, it's just, it kind of it's kind of fits the mood of this time, really, and I found it a very kind of, personally, a very um, soothing re record to listen to. Oh, well, thank you very much. Did you, did you, you didn't make you give up hope and just not come back? You, you not at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, just, I want to turn to um, the album before that, which is um, Swimming in Mercury. Yeah. And I want to, again, talk about that reflective nature of your songwriting. Uh, I just want to sort of ask you about the, the, the song, A Letter to My Younger Self, because there's a few tracks on Swimming in Mercury that are very reflective about your younger life. But again, very not looking back um going oh where did it all go wrong or no. my, my life was rubbish when i was younger you look back in a very nostalgic and very positive way and i think that song in particular let's say yourself it's um yeah uh, in that kind of genre of writing i think it stands out because it's it's very personal and, and but but you you kind of you know you reflect on things that maybe haven't gone quite right for you but it's looking back on your life as being very optimistic i felt so you know is, is that the case yeah because yeah, it's very simple. It's very so. It's probably the most simple. Well, I, I, if you could write a letter to your younger self, you'd say, you know, it's going to be all right. That's all. That's kind of, and, and that's a nice thing because things that used to really bug you and worry you or panic you when you were seventeen. I mean, of course, you're always going to have. But yeah, that that oh, <laughs> you disappeared. Oh, mother, so. No, you're back. Oh, back. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, all of that record was actually, it, it was, uh, yes, it's about, I grew up in a very, very boring North London suburb, and I just thought it would be fun to write songs about growing up up there. And it was, uh, it was, yeah, those, these last two records have probably been my most enjoyable to write and record, especially working with um, Chris Pepper, who's this guy who's, uh, I've been working with for a while. He's just he he totally under. I can say that anything to him, and he goes, "All right, let's try and do that then." And it's <laughs> I've waited my whole life to be in studio situations where I come up with some, you know. I, I remember on Chris Difford's last record, I think it was. I said, "I want I want to I, I want to play a uh, I want it to sound like a jug band." And he went, "Okay," and he said, uh, "Well, we haven't got a jug. Okay, do you mind if I empty your big?" A uh, tin of Nescafe, and I, I try and use that as a as a jug for a jug band. And he went, okay. Whereas I th uh, people I've worked with before might have thought I'd lost the plot. And then he, then patient, he was very patient with me as I sort of blew granules of coffee all over his studio. <laughs> <laughs> it's also interesting, Boo, that uh, let's do my younger self. I mean, the yeah. the, the production values on that track. Yeah more contrasting than the ones with silhouette i mean it's a much more upbeat almost kind of blue-eyed soul thing isn't it yes exactly because so, yeah i wanted to reflect that it was actually a song written for the, the bible one of it when we reformed but i did then de-bible it by putting in some really nice i was really pleased with some of the really scrunchy changes in it and then gustav did that fantastic horn section and yeah I, I just wanted it to be a joyful just a joyful thing you know I remember when we were working in the studio, it was just very exciting because it felt very, very joyful. So, and it was great. I, you know, I know a lot of my records are quite reflective, but I do like making a bit more of a racket sometimes. So. <laughs> Work, for sure. Yeah. Well, Boo, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. It, it's been brilliant to, uh, hope so. to spend the afternoon right. with you. Yeah. Let's, see, let's see if this sounds well. When the time hangs so heavy Goes by so slow with the days They are gone Before you know After all you have seen You've nothing to show Then you're a silhouette 
When you just can't remember who you should be when all that you are is a faint memory when shadows are your only company then you're a Once the world was made of color A kaleidoscope of light Now those colors all are running And everything is black and white To circumstance a lonely wallflower When it's time to dance When you know in your heart You're the ghost of a chance Then you're a silhouette Then you're a Now that's really interesting because I did wonder how that song would work on guitar rather okay. than with a dulcet tone, and it it's perfect, isn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah, works both ways. Thing about songs, you can play them on anything. That's what I love about song. A good song is a good song. Well, Boo, thank you for performing that for us. No um, I know there's lot, lots going on on um, your Facebook page with Patreon. Uh, you're doing lots of bits and bobs oh, yeah, that you're giving away yeah, on Patreon, aren't you? Know? Yeah, I just like doing things. That's really yeah, so we'll, we'll I, plug I'm that. Stuff. To, I'm about to do some mentoring now, and then after that, I'm doing a charity concert for refugees in Glasgow. So, I'm and then I'm, I'm hoping that once this lockdown's over, I've, I've got an ample sized garden um, that, that would be brilliant for a performance. It. So, I know you do some type house gigs and things, so we'll, hopefully, it'd be brilliant to get you down here sometime nice, to Leeds. Yeah. And um, I, I will, I will do it properly. But all I can say is thank you for your time today. It's been brilliant to have you as a guest. And um, all the best for the rest of the lockdown. And thank we look you, forward you to seeing you on trains and back in venues again soon. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye, Simon. Thank you.